And I think that's important for people who are experiencing chronic illness to know and to think about is that even though you may not be having the best time in your, in your body may be like attacking you literally sometimes, that being aware of the little things sometimes will give you moments where you might have a little mental relief, not physical relief, you know? Welcome to Invisible Not Broken. Today we'll be discussing some favorite books and TV series, along with takeaways about delight, parenting, and feminism. Our host Monica is joined by musician, chef, and activist Dion Bullard, who lives with end-stage renal disease. You have new organs. I know, right? I was about to say, oh yeah, you know, I'm feeling better every day. I'm getting stronger every day. And then I was like, I think I say that because that's kind of what you're supposed to say when you when people know that you are experiencing chronic illness uh-huh. or something. And you just like, you should say, oh, like, well, I'm better. I'm getting started. And it's like, to be totally honest, I feel completely normal again, you know, which is amazing in itself. And I'm so grateful for that. I don't feel like I'm getting better. I, I feel literally back to normal. I'm still getting used to like, the weirdness of going to the bathroom, you know, because I didn't urinate for 18 years. You know, we talked about a lot of things, but I don't think I asked you about that one. Probably not. You know, I think we are much more comfortable. We're like old friends now. I mean, they pretty <laughs> much adopted you. I feel like I kidnapped you. Like, I know, like, right. Hey, Monica, how are you? I'm like, oh, you're now mine for the next three days. It's that- so funny. And it's funny. I love that, though, because we love all the same stuff. It's it's such a testament to how, like, you're much more alike with people than you really, really realize. You know what I mean? And that's the beauty of podcasts and stuff like that. And you get to know people through creative spaces because you find out, like, how much more alike you are, even though you appear very different. And so that's amazing. I do want to put a caveat that I feel like artists, like if you're an artist, writer, you know, creatives, I feel like that's so Mm -hmm. true for most of us. Like most of us are weirdly similar, Mm -hmm. except for platonic. And we're going to have to get to that one because you recommended platonic and I can get through an episode. So sorry, I tried. Really? I tried so hard, my friend. The finale just ended. They just had the the last one just came on yesterday. My husband had to listen to like my stand-up comedy riff on that show for like two days. Wow. What was it about platonic that you just couldn't get with? And yeah, maybe it gets better the more you get oh. into it. And I am not insulting. Like, you know, we all have mm-hmm. our taste and everything, but... I have a lot of male friends. Like, I have so many guys in my life who are like my brothers. I love them. We talk about everything. It felt like a man's idea of what women and men would talk about. Like, it was like they could not have a discussion without, like, talking about, like, intricacies of sex and sex lives. And it's like, I I talk to my male friends about sex, but we don't. It's not a frat boy conversation. It's actually... It's not a one-sided kind of a feeling. It felt very much like women were out of the writer's room in that one. Right, and I didn't notice that probably because I'm a guy and it just kept seeming completely normal. You know what I mean? Yeah. But now that you say that, like, I totally get that. Like, I totally get that. What is this particular episode of the podcast about? What is this? Um, You know, I was going back and forth with it. I thought that today we would uh-huh. talk about different cultural things, like different ways... They entertained while you're chronically okay. ill, while you're in dialysis or while you're in chemo there, like whatever mm-hmm. you're doing where you are like, I can't work right now. I am stuck. So I thought we'd talk about, you know, books, podcasts, shows that we love. The ways to entertain yourself while you're being oppressed at dialysis center. (laughs) Yes, yes. I feel like that's a title for this, which I'm happy to bow out on that one on all fronts. While you're disenfranchised. This is my gentle pushing you towards your own podcast of like, Absolutely. I really want you to. And I definitely want to do it because my doctor extended my medical leave until January. So we we would definitely have time to seriously. And I, I definitely want to do that because I think it's such a great opportunity to take a, a, a break from the trials and the daily stuff that we go through in dealing with medications, and illnesses, and body pains, and, and all that kind of stuff. Like, it's a it's a welcome break, but, but still, like, honoring the truth of that, you know, at the same time and, and, and dealing with that. So that's fun. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about 
Okay, so platonic. Yes. So Apple TV's platonic, starring Rose Byrne, Seth Rogen, Carla Gallio, Trey Hale, Janet Fernie, and Andrew Lopez. See, we have not known each other long enough, so I'm just going to explain something really fast to you. I'm an unapologetic, rabid, bunny, foaming at the mouth feminist. And uh-huh. I do not make any apologies for this. And this has like my okay. favorite trope of the please feed this woman immediately. A 10 on the attractive scale if you find that super skinny look attractive. And she has to maintain this incredibly skinny body through this entire show. And he gets to smoke pot, eat pizza. Just be a slob. This is like really unequal level in what's expected. And every single freaking show that that man has been in has been super hot wife. And he's a below average kind of looking guy. <laughs> my my Kinsey scale is not uh-huh. in that realm of things. Like, with goes my husband, anyone Lisa Bonet has been married to and women. So <laughs> I'm not the one to talk to about whether he's hot or not. I just think it's really <laughs> fucked up how much we put. The emphasis on what women look like and how women are held to some this realistic and unfair standard of what's acceptable in entertainment. And it's like yeah. a visual thing we're constantly reminded of, of like, he gets Katherine Heigl and knocked up. And you're like, I'm sorry, wait. So the, the message right. is, ladies, you don't have to be attracted to him to marry. Okay, I, but you mm-hmm. have to stay hot the whole time. So that right off the bat was kind of like, a, okay, so we're, we're doing that. All right. And then it just kind of devolved into this idea that men and women are either having sex or they are talking about sex in a way that, I don't talk to my female friends about sex like that. I don't talk to right. male friends like that. It was very like. That was one of the things that I actually found the most refreshing about the show was that the expectation on these kind of shows is that it starts off as they're just platonic friends and then they always end up in bed. And I thought that that was great that it was really just a platonic relationship. They were, it, no matter what, you know, spoiler alert from the beginning to the end, but it kind of started to feel a little weird toward the end, the last few episodes. It's kind of felt like there was some emotional jealousy when he got a new girlfriend and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I like a very wide range of shows and comedy types and stuff like that. And so this was kind of like dry and corny at the same time. But like the physical comedy stuff that she does in the show, there's not a lot of it. But like, there's this one particular scene in in that episode because you haven't, you only got to one episode. So I'm going to just like ruin the whole series for you. I'm going to do that a lot in this conversation. I'm going to ruin it for you if you haven't seen it. We we put a spoiler alert out there. Life is short. Right. You watch it or don't, but we, we do not have the energy to not. So the general premise of the entire show is Rose Byrne is married to her husband. Is, her, name is, her name is Charlie. Her name is Sylvia. And when, when, when the show starts, she's a, a mom of two or three kids. And he is an attorney. You learn that she was an attorney before she had the kid. And now she's a stay-at-home mom pretty much in her hood while her husband goes to work. You also find that she and her best friend, Seth Rogen, are estranged because he met this woman and he wanted to marry her. And, and Sylvia, Rose Byrne's character, immediately told him that she wasn't the right person for him. So they kind of fell out. And so that's where it starts. All of that has happened before the show starts. She sees on social media that he got divorced, I think. And so her husband goes, oh, you guys are really good friends. You should reach out. And so that joins them and reconnects them. And so they have all these weird, like funny best friend capers throughout the series. And it's just really, really funny. So one instance without telling the whole show, she's giving him a divorce party. And so she goes to dinner with him and several of his guy friends. And so she's the only woman at the table. Two of the guys at the table are his business partners in the brewery. So the youngest guy, who was the kind of chubby Puerto Rican guy, who was hilarious, he's at the table and he goes, hey, you guys want to go to the strip club? And so she's like, no, I don't want to go. You guys just go ahead and go. And then he goes, I have something that'll make us have a wonderful time. And he pulls up this baggie of cocaine. Thank you. You really just like highlighted most of what I did not enjoy about this 
<laughs> I mean, like, the only thing you did not touch on was that she says that she's working at the law firm because she helps her husband. And that just annoyed me to no end. I was like, wait a minute, honey. There is nothing wrong with being a stay-at-home mom. Like, stay-at-home mom yeah. is awesome. Like, that is huge work. Own that one. Like, or go back to working. Like, you do what you need to do. Throughout the series, she does that. She goes back to work. I, I'm glad to hear it. There's, it just really <laughs> felt like there was not a woman in the writer's room. And that, the, like, it yeah. just, I, I might be wrong about that i haven't checked but you need to tell me like what your comfort <laughs> show is like do you have like a show like when you are just feeling like hell i have like five shows i've watched like 30 times all the way through you know what what's funny and what's interesting i don't watch things twice really i won't watch it twice oh my god i don't even like watching movies twice unless it's been a long time i am learning so much about you it's so funny and, and you know i just in my journey to self-realization and analyzation, I realized that I don't like to repeat shows. The only time I'll repeat a show is if I'm watching it and I'll fall asleep. And that happens and then I'll end up watching an episode like five times. But You just hit parenthood <laughs> on the head. Like this is like yeah. about 10 years of my life with young children. I was rewatching mm -hmm. things because I fell asleep during. So I'm always on the search of what to watch next. And so you're going to think this is absolutely crazy. I have not been to sleep in 24 hours because, because you know, I'm recording some jazz songs. And so I recorded yesterday and then I went to Twin Dragon, my Chinese place that I love and ate some wonton soup and then I came home. And then from eight or nine o'clock until right when you texted me at 1055, I was watching movies and I watched an entire series. So I have several shows. Okay, what, what, what did you watch at like two in the morning? What were okay, you so the first thing I started watching was this amazing series. It's a British series. It was, it's on Hulu. It's called Somewhere Boy. Oh, I'm going to write that down. No, you should. I'm serious. You should totally be taking notes and all the listeners should know because I'm telling you. So this was 2023. It just came out this year. I'll give you the synopsis without ruining the entire show for you because you're going to watch it. And once you start, you're not going to stop. I watched it all the way through this morning. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the show. You meet Danny and his dad. When you meet Danny, Danny is about six years old and he's living with his dad. What you discover is that his mom died when he was a small child, a very small child, like maybe a few months old. His father, they live in like a, a remote area in the British countryside, somewhere, the English countryside somewhere, in a house that surrounded a wooded area. And he does not let Danny go outside at all under the guise that there are monsters out there that will kill him. I see like we're getting into mental health issues. No, listen, I'm, te I'm telling you, it's sad and beautiful all at the same time because I think it illustrates the struggle that, that parents have, not that I would know because I don't have kids, but that parents have of your ultimate goal in your life is to protect your child from anything that you think that would hurt them. And in some cases, what this shows you is that sometimes your the very thing that you want to do, protect your kid, is harmful to them. He keeps him in the house until he's 18 years old. He never goes outside. But the father leaves every day and kills an animal like a rabbit and smears it on his face and makes his son think he went out to kill monsters. To keep his, and his son believes it. Watch the show. That's all I'm going to tell you. It's disturbing, but it's brilliant at the same time. I can do right now Jane Austen movies and comedy. I, my dad died August of last year, so this is July right now. So I am like in feels such a little heavy. That feels a little right heavy right now. I'm like Richardson look good. I think I can. Nope, not Richardson. Dad dies. All right. What we do in the shadows just came out today, so that's absolutely what I'm doing. Oh, today. what we do in the shadows. I love what we do in the shadows. I think that is brilliant. I think that show is brilliant. How could you not rewatch it? I have rewatched that whole thing four times. I can't rewatch it. Like, I have to watch the new season. But listen, okay, so something okay. that's a little lighter. It's on Amazon. It's called I Am a Virgo. Much, much more light. It's about a, well, wait, now that I think about it, it's kind of the same thing. It's exactly the same show almost. Wait. Are you having <laughs> a moment <laughs> after lockdown where you're like, I don't no, know about no, this lockdown funny. thing? No, it's funny. No, it's funny. I'm laughing because I didn't realize 
that it's almost the same premise, but it's lighter and it's, it's fantasy because he's born as a giant baby and he just grows to be 13 feet tall. It's modern day Oakland. Wow, that's my town. He's a black kid from a black family and he grows to be 13 feet tall. And his mom and dad hide him away in the house. And then he discovers other people. And then he goes out into the world and he realizes that they were really just trying to protect him, but they were lying to him. Well, they weren't really lying to him because they were saying that everybody in the world is not as nice as us. You're a giant, you're a huge person. And so the world is going to try to exploit you and take advantage of you. But the whole show is a very light, it's a comedy. It's not a drama. It's not heavy. It's not all of that at all. And it, 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 it is a safe watch. Nobody dies. Nobody, you know, gets killed. It has some Oakland activism in it. And it has, oh, okay, even better show. The Righteous Gemstones is back. Oh my God, that is a ride and a half. I was not bored a single moment during that show. My favorite character is Judy Gemstone by far. I love her husband. Her husband cracks me up. Her husband is such a... A lame. He is hilarious. I love all of them. I even love the flashbacks because the younger versions of them was spot on casting because those younger characters act exactly like their older counterparts, like they studied them. I'm just done with Max at the moment. I, mm -hmm. I'm letting it go. I watched the Sex and the City reboot because I was that bored. I'm not a Sex and the City person at all. I'm not even interested in that in, in the least. <laughs> yeah. Oh, another series with Kim Cattrall, as a matter of fact, called Glamorous on Netflix. Yeah, that was good. It was cute. It was cute and light and inclusive. I love inclusive. My favorite one so far this year was Our Flag Means Death. That might be my favorite show of all time. Our Flag Means Death. Our Flag Means Death. So the guy wait, who wait, wait, did wait, wait, wait. What We Do in the Shadows made a pirate show. Yes. Yes, on Flag Me Stand. I started watching it and I got to go back to it. See, I get yeah. so confused with a bunch of stuff that I'm watching. I start watching something and then I completely forget about it. Our Flag Means Death is great. I feel like you're much younger than I am, but maybe you remember a time before streaming where when you were homesick, like I watched Bewitch episodes mm -hmm. and like I did with Jeannie mm -hmm. because I'm from the 80s. Like, be, I remember mm -hmm. before VCRs. That's how old I am. And like, all those old shows. Total dump of information and new shows that come at us constantly. It's just like, yeah. I'm almost finding it stressful, like anxiety inducing. It's a struggle to keep up sometimes. It's this constant FOMO. I'm like, I don't even work anymore and I have FOMO. What, what is that? Right. Like, too much. And so you find yourself finding comfort in those old familiar shows. That's um, right. Like Adam's family. You know, my daughter and I. Adam's family, of course. So here's the reason <laughs> they're going to differ because I have the like ear set because I have a 16 year old daughter and uh -huh. that child called out stuff. My husband are like, oh God, we were kind of from the eighties and we didn't hear. Oh yeah, you're right. He should not have punched the wall by her head and then kissed her. That was not romantic. You're right, totally right honey. Oh my God. We're going to turn right. off Star Wars now. Let's Breakfast Club. And so I thought, right. like, oh, well, yeah, I remember Bewitched when I was a kid. Let's watch, you know, we have, but since she's been little, I've been sick my whole life. And I got really sick right after she was born. And so we have what uh -huh. we call Darling Slug Days, where we curl up in bed. We have our, like, iPads. And, like, the kids would just snuggle on the bed with me. And we would just do crafts on the bed and watch shows. And mm -hmm. still, I have lots of days in bed. So my 16-year-old curls up with me. I'm like, oh, it'd be so cute to watch some of the shows I watched when I was home sick when I was little. And let's watch Bewitched. That was, I think, 15 minutes we got through before she and I were looking at each other going, she's like, this, you watched, you were, I'm like, I, we were conditioned to think this was okay. I am really glad for your generation. Let's turn this off. So Adam's Family is like the one show that holds up so good. It is so fun. It's very wholesome. Man. Like, oh my God, a man who sees like his wife on TV. You know? like, yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. likes his kids. He wants to hang out with his children. It's, it's yeah. just so cute and fun. So that's our 1960s show that we watched. So we, you started watching Silo. Did you finish it? In one day. Brilliant show, right? I barely was able to get to the bathroom. Like, I I was like, I know you have to work tomorrow, honey, but if you don't want me telling you what happens during the day, you better just right. take away. Like, this is a marriage marathon right now. This is what we do instead of therapy. 
let's go. And so we watched the whole thing. That ending blew my mind. I will not spoil that one because I feel like that's a really new show. Absolutely. So people should, people should really watch it. You know, if you want the ranting, raving feminist idea on this one, this was the first show I've seen where the women were not given glam makeup in the apocalypse. And they actually wore clothes. And next they had stuff to do. They and they were powerful, strong women. But I've seen a few shows where it's like, okay, they're strong women, but when did they have time to put eyeliner on and shave? And eyelashes. Yeah, and, and <laughs> come on, go. We're going to work around machinery. Daisy Dukes would be a great idea. They, everyone was like actually actively dressed for what they do. If you're looking for hot people, I mean, like it was a bisexual's dream for, oh my gosh, that's a lot of pretty. Mm. It was pretty gorgeous, amazing, smart, and never insulted anyone. I didn't feel like the writers or the people who cast hated a group of people. Right, and the ending right. was gag worthy. Like, I think that our neighbors thought we were watching the Super Bowl from all the, oh my God. Yes, I was in awe from episode one. I'm excited about Foundation. Foundation on the 14th and also Invasion on on Apple Plus is really good too. Okay. Have you seen that? I have not. So it's, it's one season in so far, but I was watching both of those simultaneously because I think when they first premiered last year, it was a dream because they were very, very close. Invasion kind of reminds you of a series like Alien. I've never seen it. But it's about an alien invasion that happens all over the world. You should totally watch it. That's all I'm going to say, but it's really, really really good. And I, I have way too many streaming services. It's a problem. It's giving me anxiety. But if I was going to get rid of all of them and keep one, it would be Apple Plus. Like They have the best stuff. But they have come up with some of the best shows. Like Dickinson was my first introduction to it. And that blew You know, my I started watching Dickinson, but I didn't really get all the way into it. Oh, really? Okay. What was really good also was The Life and Time of Tolome Gray starring Samuel L. Jackson. That was on Apple Plus. I mean, Samuel Jackson, you're just going to love it. A no-brainer. That series is based on a series of books, Easy Rollins novels. I forget the author's name, but the books are brilliant. Like, do you read a lot when you're in your chair or do you just watch the shows? I actually sleep. I do love to read. Like I have stacks of books like everywhere. I have one on my desk right here. Yeah? That I love reading. Okay, what is this? The Power of Now. The Guide is Her Shalit, Eckhart Tolle, and do you love it? I love Eckhart. His book, A New Earth, if I go to my living room and get it, it has like cool sticks and dog ears and like tabs all in the book. I said I don't rewatch shows, but I okay. will reread the book. I will reread the book. You're fascinating. Okay. Especially a book that's kind of like intellectual and spiritual and self-developmental aspects to it, like the Eckhart Tolle books. A New Earth talks about how to release your ego, your personal ego and around awareness and self-awareness and stuff like that. And so it's excellent, excellent, excellent. It's excellent series of books. I, I've discovered it when the Oprah Winfrey show was still on. She That's did an entire classroom series on the book, A New Earth. I will be picking that up. I just read something like The Series of the Lights. Uh, it was written by a poet and I don't have anything that I can just look it up right now, but I've always been like, no on self-help books, like just absolutely not. Uh -huh. Really? I've been around too many women in the Silicon Valley where it was very like a lot of bullshit. Like it was a lot of sequel. Focus, focus. Yeah. I mean, whatever you believe that makes you feel better, muscle tough, plus right, if you don't right. be mean to each other. Like mm -hmm. that's all right. I asked. And then someone gave me a book and it just blew my mind called Untamed by Glennon Doyle. Thank you very much on that one. I gave it to everyone. It has now ended in five divorces and three marriages that are much better, but it is, it just kind of broke my brain on like, I shouldn't just say no to a type of book because of that. So I was starting to read a lot more things like a series of delights and like, I'm more of a fiction person, but this has been really kind of an interesting thing to look at new stuff. I like fiction books. Well, I love anything history, right? I love okay. period pieces. I like period dramas, Yellowstone, 1883, 1923, like the whole Yellowstone universe I'm obsessed with. But I like to read books that reflect me like things about African-Americans and historical fiction. This one book by this amazing author named Tanashi Coates. He's oh brilliant. God, yes, Tanashi Coates is brilliant. His book, The Water Dancer, is absolutely amazing. It's about a young Black man in modern day who has memories that triggers a power that teleports him to the time 
where slavery was active and that power helps him help slaves escape. And it's like beautifully written. And it's not a downer slave, you know, thing. It's not that at all. And it's not even about like the crazy trauma of slavery, even though that was very real. It's not even about that. It's just a fancy, magical realism, science fiction, fantasy historical drama and all of that stuff all at the same time bring a writer bring a book so do you do like audiobook or are you pure just hold it in your hand i love to hold a book in my hand i'm getting more into using kindle on my ipad i think that's amazing especially because i'm getting i feel like i'm getting old and i need readers so i need what you mean these coke glasses here that i have here i need them on right now like i need i'm gonna go get an eye exam so that i can get the right ones my birthday was week before last about eight friends of mine we went to the chinese restaurant i went to last night and i was looking at the menu and i was like yeah yeah i said oh my god i said i can't see this and three people at the table like took their readers out i was like here and i was like let me see i put it on. i was like oh my god i was like i can't see I can actually see. It was so funny. My friend was like, I should be recording you because you, the genuine look of glow of joy on your face. I was like, it's right here. I can actually see everything. It's right here. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I mean, you're going to have new eyesight, new kidneys. You're going to have everything brand new this year. Exactly. Brand new everything. New and it's like, it's a new song. It's like a total place of joy. And that's like what life is about, especially when you're experiencing chronic illness, finding little pockets of joy anywhere you can and grabbing them and holding on to them as much as you can, because you never know, you know, we, you do it as well as I do. You never know when the next pocket of joy is going to come and how long it's going to take to get there. You that know? Was, I, mean, I read um, that book, The Daily Do I am going to find it, and I swear it'll be in the show notes. Ross Gay was the one who wrote it. But mm -hmm. his whole thing was every single day, he was going to sit down for 15 minutes and handwrite mm -hmm. the thing that delight, one thing that delighted him. Mm -hmm. So like my husband and I were listening to the show and I do a lot of books on tape. I like to just have it in my ear going. So it just kind of became a thing that he and I started doing at the end of the night was we would just challenge each other to find three things that delighted us during the day. Like, like when I was watering and I found like this insanely chonk bumblebee. Like this bumblebee had cakes. It was like little really? fuzzy. Chunky little bumblebee. Oh, little chunky happy <laughs> bumblebee that fallen all its little <laughs> arm. And I was so happy. I was like, well, those things was just uh -huh. like the light. So we just try every night to go through things that made us happy because it sort of rewired my brain with what you're talking about. Like you don't know when the next one's coming. This sort of like gave me confidence that the next one's coming because every day I could come up with three things pretty easily mm -hmm. from like a bumblebee to my 16 year old showed me one of her art pieces to uh, my son <laughs> called me yesterday just to say hi I mean when your 22 year old calls up to say hey mom I miss you that's all it takes by the way anyone who's listening to this if you like your parent call them tell them hi it does more than you could ever think if you like them if it's healthy for you that's that's the caveat I was like, it did remember my brain on delight. Like that was a really cool thing that happened because I, I was feeling, especially this year of grieving and the weight gain from new pills has been like, it's not even a vanity issue. It's more of a, just a discomfort issue of like clothes don't fit. Nothing feels right. It's like, oh, so I was like to find the delight, sort of like rewired something that will make you happy will come along. You just have to micro your vision on it sometimes. And uh, what I was about to say is that in making that list, right, you're intentional about finding those things, right? And it makes you much more aware of that bumblebee. You know what I mean? Because you're looking for that thing that gives you joy and that those little pockets of joy and stuff. And so because you're intentionally looking for that, and I think that's important for people who are experiencing chronic illness to know and to think about is that, you know, even though you may not be having the best time in your, in, in your, your body may be like attacking you literally sometimes, that being aware of the little things sometimes will give you moments where you might have a little mental relief not physical relief from those moments and those times when your body is not feeling the best or you're not feeling the best. 
And, you know, you feel like the world hates you, you know? You mean when, like, Congress is like, opioids should not be given to anyone. And you're like, wait, I'm going to die without them. Exactly. Once again, it's like you being aware and present enough to enjoy what the sunshine feels like on your skin if you could stand it that day or <laughs> being outside or, or even if you go into the shade someplace or, or open a window and realizing that that fresh air, that breeze, that gust of wind just made you happy in that instant. And so I would say be intentional about finding moments of emotional relief. Oh, emotional relief. That's beautiful. I love that. And like a book or a show or a lighthearted comedy, you know, maybe not so much Dahmer, but maybe (laughs) watch something, something, you know, watch some Disney Plus stuff or something. And so I'm like, I'm trying to be careful about the shows and stuff that I talk about because I'm like, you like a lot of dark stuff. I'm just realizing that I'm being aware, made aware that I like a lot of stuff. That's funny. (laughs) They just did a study on like the people who watch things like Dahmer to fall asleep. Yes, Especially late at night. It's so funny. I have a friend and I'm like, what are you going to do tonight? He's like, oh, I'm just going to stay home and watch the first 48. I'm like, why do you watch that? It's something weird about it. But, you know, like murder mysteries and like I've been obsessed with documentaries lately. So anything that has anything to do with like true crime Uh and like true crime, I'm there. I'm like totally into it. I feel like Tiger King jump-started, like, an entire generation of people watching the true crime documentaries. Like, everyone watched that show. It certainly really, really spurred that true crime podcast yeah. industry because the Tiger King thing was crazy. They, I just recently saw pictures of Joe Exclusive online in prison. He was in prison, like... I mean, I remember him when he was on John Oliver. I, I actually got a John Oliver shout-out once, which was very depressing. Really? He called me a bad mother, which I was like, okay, that tracks. A bad mother? Oh, wow. And I my son was obsessed with him when he was a kid and John Oliver was running a podcast and my ability to say what's appropriate or not appropriate for children should never be taken into account by anyone. I have no, I have a barometer. <laughs> and I think for the record, yeah. that makes you a wonderful mom. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, it does. You know why? Because it, because it puts your kids in a position to have a very wide you know, somewhat dangerous perspective on everything. And that builds character. That's character building. And like, I, I, they're going to get exposed to shit. So I would rather they get exposed to things where they still care what I have to say about it so I can help guide. Right. Like, this is a thing that can happen. Here's a way it can feel. You, you guide how they see it. Yeah. Well, and how do you deal with fear? Like, I never understood. Like, yeah. I was not the mom you wanted to have in the mom's group. They hated me with a flaming mm-hmm. passion. Like, none of the moms would talk. <laughs> because, like, they'd be like, oh, my gosh, we can't let our children watch Harry Potter. They'll get scared. And, like, you don't think kids ever going to get scared in their life? Right. Why exactly. wouldn't you want to be there to tell them how to be scared, how to handle fear? Like That's, that's so funny. Our job is not to keep them from these things because they're going to come in. Our job is to teach them how to handle those things. Exactly. My nephew, is he'll be five this year and his mother I love her parenting style because they live in Colorado and if he wants to go outside and lay down in the rain water and make water angels she totally lets him do it if he wants to jump off the porch she lets him jump off the porch you know what I mean it's like she was rock climbing when she was pregnant with him which is why he's an absolute lunatic my girl she said he's her first child Mm -hmm. and she always said while she was pregnant she's like the thing that I do not want is a scary kid. She was like, I don't want a scary kid. I want a kid that's fearless and that wants to explore everything and, you know, is inquisitive and wants to, and, and that's exactly who he is. Like on Mother's Day, he was up on a chair trying to make pancakes. You know what I mean? Like he's, like, he always has to cook. And I, and I think that, like, I can imagine you being that kind of parent that encourages your kids to, like, jump off the top bunk bed. My husband and I met when my son was <laughs> seven months old. So, like, my husband's always been around my son. My husband, if he was any nicer, like, I used to call him Mr. Rogers before we started dating. Like, he is, he never, he said oopsie Davey <laughs> without any fucking irony. I have gotten that man swearing. <laughs> 17 years, he finally is swearing. That's funny. And when, so when you were talking about these other shows where, the, like, the whole thing was, like, protection, I'm like, I either fucked up really bad with my kids or, maybe <laughs> that's, like, the warning. But I always told him, like, if, if we're talking about anything from broken limb down, we do not get mm-hmm. involved because those things heal and we can teach them how to like do things safer but when my mm-hmm. son was, like, walking on things like they would only be like an inch or two above the ground he would walk behind him like mm-hmm. this and i would grab him like no i think that in general it's a great way to be because it teaches them 
maybe not that exact thing will translate later on in life, but that concept of going after what you want and not being afraid to experience new things. Yeah. And that general concept is something that they will never lose. And even though they may forget everything else you said, they won't forget those types of lessons. You know what I mean? I mean, because kids don't ever do what their parents want them to do, but they will <laughs> never forget what you taught them and never forget what you showed them. You know what I mean? And so what you teach them every day is how to fucking live with a chronic illness and how let it not to take you out every day. And you show them a, a level of strength that they are going to need, whether they have a chronic illness later on or just in their daily lives. And that's something that is in value. And so I commend you as a parent. So fuck whoever said that you're not in good mind. I mean, anytime my kids go to therapy, I'm going to like take this last paragraph and just play it for the therapist first. I'm like, okay, yeah, um, we're closing on an hour. I just wanted to say for anyone who's considering okay. having children or has teenagers, deep breaths, it's going to be okay. And they won't remember a damn thing you said. You can say anything you want. They will not hear you. They only know what you show them. So if you give what you want your kids to be like, because nothing else matters, they will not hear what you have to say. Absolutely. Yeah, they're very cute, though. They're never boring. I am never bored. Not once. I wish I was more bored. Because you're not boring. So it's literally impossible for them to be bored because <laughs> you are not a boring person. I can imagine your kids' personalities. Oh, neither one is short on personality. <laughs> we are highly entertaining. You are not bored when you hang out with us as a family. But we are closing on an hour. I can convince you to start your own podcast. There's no convincing needed, lady. Oh, good. Everyone, be kind, gentle, be a badass. You have Dion's show to look forward to on the Invisible Not Broken Network. Yeah. You know what the title is as soon as we know. Tinu Speak will be coming soon. Tinu is dealing with some health issues, so we had to put that on hold for a minute, but she will be coming back strong and soon. If you have anything extra, please go to her website. We'll have a link, but if you can donate, she is trying to meet her cancer drug fast. So if you can donate, please do. Be kind, be gentle, be a badass, and we will see you soon. Read more books and watch more shows. Oh my God, please support <laughs> the writers. My God, support the yeah. Writers Guild and the Actors Guild. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. To find out more about today's episode, including show notes, transcripts, and more, please visit invisiblenotbroken.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also support this show by heading over to our Patreon or by sharing these episodes. We are not advertising, and our growth is thanks to you listeners. Thank you to our host, Monica and Dion, for a great conversation. This episode was edited by me, Luke Spine. Last but not least, be kind, be gentle, and be badass.